heal the sick, tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. And God is looking for men and women with a different spirit that will not limit him. I want to share a, a, a story that comes from church history. Now the time for the Messianic secret is over, right? Now the time is to spread the good news to the ends of the earth. Well, there was a woman who had breast cancer, and this is the, around the year 400 AD. This is a true story. She had breast cancer, and her doctors told her, we're sorry, there's nothing more we can do for you. You're probably, you don't have much time left. And this woman was a fervent Christian, and she prayed, Oh, Lord, please heal me. I don't want to die. And then the next thing she knows, she had a dream, a prophetic dream. So this woman had a dream, and in the dream, she was given instructions. She was told, go to the Easter Vigil Mass. That's the high point of the liturgical year, right? The Easter Vigil Mass, the celebration of the Lord's resurrection, that's the night when new Christians are baptized. And she was told, go to that Mass, and the first woman who comes up out of the baptismal font, have her make the sign of the cross over your cancer, and you'll be healed. So she wakes up from the dream, and she, of course, she decides, you know, what have I got to lose? I'm going to do that. She goes to the Easter Vigil Mass, and the first woman who came up from the baptismal font, she asked her, please make the sign of the cross over my cancer. And this woman did, and she was totally healed. <laughs> One of the things I love about that story is that the woman who did the healing is not somebody who through prayer and fasting and virtue had reached the seventh story of the, the mountain of holiness. She was not somebody with an international healing ministry with books and tapes and conferences. Just a brand new Christian, full of faith in the Lord. And the Lord did that miracle through her. But then the, the rest of the story is that the, the bishop found out that this had happened and he called the woman who had been healed to himself, the little chat. And he said to her, is it true you were healed of breast cancer this way? She said, yes, it's true. And he reprimanded her. Then why haven't you told everybody about it? And she kind of didn't know what to say. I mean, probably a lot of us would be like that, right? I, I don't know. And her friends were with her and the bishop said, to the friends, did you know she had been healed this way? And they said, no, we had no idea. So the bishop made her tell the whole story from beginning to end. And the result was that her friends glorified God and their faith was built up. That bishop was none other than Saint Augustine of Hippo, doctor of the church. And he himself recounts that story in his book, City of God. And he actually mandated the practice that every miraculous healing that occurred in his diocese be written down as testimony and that those testimonies be read periodically at mass to strengthen the faith of his people. Isn't that great? Yes. Good advice from a wise bishop. Tell everybody about it. So now I want to give you a um, 21st century update to that story. I tell that story a lot, and I told that story a couple of years ago in Houston, Texas. And there was a woman in the audience, I'll call her Linda, who really took it to heart. And she thought to herself, there's a woman in my parish who has breast cancer, and I know this story is for her. We've been praying for her, but I know I got to tell her this story and she's got to do it. 
And so Linda decided she was going to bring this woman with breast cancer to the Easter Vigil Mass and find the first woman who had been baptized to make the sign of the cross over her. And so she did it. She, she found the woman. She told her the whole story. And she said, you know, I'll come with you. Let's go to the Easter Vigil Mass. Linda brings the other woman to that Mass. It happened to be a huge parish, 15,000 people. You probably don't have one like that in Ireland, huh? <laughs> and a lot of people were baptized that night. And there was a reception after the liturgy. And so Linda, you know, is t- taking her friend. She says, okay, let's, we, we got to find the first woman who was baptized. For some reason, she thought that was a really important part of it. Had to be the first one. And they, we went through the reception. They couldn't find who was the first woman to be baptized. So Linda finally thought, well, okay, we'll find another one who was baptized tonight. And they found another woman who was baptized that night. And they explained the whole thing to her. Will you make the sign of the cross over this woman with breast cancer? And she walked away. It was outside her box. She didn't know how to handle it. She walked away. But Linda didn't give up. She was a woman of faith. And so she said to her friend, okay, we'll, we'll find another one. And so they, they found another one at the reception, a woman who had just been baptized. And again, she explained the whole thing to her. Uh, Will you make the sign of the cross over her? And this woman is like, I was a Buddhist, you know, until tonight. I, I'm completely new at this. I don't know if I can do this. She turned to her sponsor, her godmother, and said, can I do this? And the woman said, oh, no, you're not a priest. But Linda didn't give up. <laughs> so she, she kind of shared more about it, and they, they got this, this woman who had just been baptized to, to meet with them the next day at a coffee shop. And finally, she agreed to do it. She made the sign of the cross over the woman with breast cancer. And that woman went back to the doctor, and there was no cancer. Glory to God. A demonstration of spirit and power. But I love the faith of Linda. It was a tenacious faith. It was a faith like, I will not take no for an answer. That's the faith of the Canaanite woman in the gospel. Remember the Canaanite woman whose daughter was demonized? came to Jesus, you know, healed my daughter, and he, he seemed to refuse, and she would not give up. And after Jesus even said, you know, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, she, this lady would not take no for an answer. Come on, Lord, even the, even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table. And at that point, was Jesus annoyed? I mean, did he say, I'm sorry, lady, I told you no. No, he was thrilled. He was thrilled at that kind of faith. He said, finally, you get it. A woman, great is your faith. Go home and it will be done for you as you have asked. He loves that kind of persistent, tenacious faith. It's the faith of his own mother, the wedding of Cana. My hour has not yet come, right? She came to him, they have no more wine. My hour has not yet come. She would not take no for an answer. She just turned to the servants, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> He's going to take care of this. He's got this. Jesus is like, no, that's not my time to begin because that's going to set in motion the chain of events. It's going to lead to the, the cross. Do whatever he tells you. At that point, Jesus didn't have a choice anymore, right? <laughs> he had to do it. <laughs> he can't resist that kind of faith. He wants that kind of faith in us. Now, I have to tell you one other little follow-up to the story that is it's kind of interesting. Somebody heard me tell this second part of the story about Houston, and they sent me an email. I get these random emails a lot. And this lady is like, I, I heard about the, the woman who was healed of breast cancer in Houston. Could you please explain to me all the steps? Because I have a friend with breast cancer, and I want to do the same thing. And I had to write back and tell her, it doesn't work that way. It's not about a formula. It's not about, you know, if you do all of these things, you will be guaranteed, everybody with breast cancer, you know, if they just go to the Easter Vigil Mass and carry out these steps, they'll all be healed. It doesn't work that way. Linda was led by the Spirit. 
faith rubbed up in her. She was, she was led to take those st- steps and, and hold on to tenacious faith, even when it seemed she wasn't going to get anywhere. And, and the Lord so honors that faith. But we can't make it into a formula. We can't make it into a mechanism. If I do A, B, C, D, I will be guaranteed. Faith is always a surrender. Jesus is always the one in control. Faith means obedience, radical obedience to what he tells us. I mean, that's Our Lady's last words, right? What are her last words in, in Scripture? Last thing she's recorded as saying in Scripture? Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. That's faith. Just like I said earlier, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Faith is also spelled O-B-E-D-I-E-N-C-E. <laughs> Obedience. Faith that is not obedient is not real faith. So, going back to um, Jesus' inaugural sermon, I shared with you the, the very first homily he gave as, as the Gospel of Luke presents it. It's at, right after he was baptized in the Jordan River. I think that the mystery of Jesus' baptism is such a profound mystery that we need to enter into more deeply. Because Jesus is the model for us, right? Jesus is the model. He says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. If we want to know how, how do we carry out our mission as Christians, as Catholics, as followers of Jesus, look to him. He's our model. And it began with his baptism just as our life in Christ begins with our baptism. So what happened at his baptism? Well, this guy named John is baptizing people in the Jordan River. He's, he's plunging them into the water as a sign of renewing their, their covenant with the Lord. And it's a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It's a baptism of repentance. Jesus comes to be baptized. We're supposed to say, well, wait a minute. Does Jesus need to repent for anything? No. He's the Son of God. Why did he come to get John's baptism? Even John was shocked. Jesus came to receive John's baptism as a way of entering into total solidarity with sinners. Jesus is not the Messiah who would stand apart and say, those losers over there, you know, I'm going to save them. No, he came right into the midst of fallen, broken, sinful humanity. He totally identified with us. And by saying yes to that baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, he, he, he put himself in the place of sinners standing under the judgment of God on sin. He was saying yes to the cross. By saying yes to his baptism, he was saying, I will be the Messiah willed by the Father. A Messiah in total solidarity with sinners. So pleasing to God. And he went down into that water and he came up from the water. Do you remember what happened next? He heard the Father's voice, but before that, the heavens were opened above him. The heavens were opened above him, and the Holy Spirit descended on him like a form, the form of a dove. He's the model for us, right? The heavens were opened, the Holy Spirit descended. Did you notice the gospel does not say, and then the heavens closed up again? doesn't say that. So the implication is that the heavens remained open above him. Jesus, from that day, walked under an open heaven. Because his whole mission 
as man was to have access to heaven. And what does what does heaven have? Blessings, healing, forgiveness, mercy, transformation, grace, power. His mission was to have access to all of that so he could distribute it on earth. So he walked under an open heaven. It's the model for us. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The gospel tells us that from that time of his baptism, he was full of the Holy Spirit. I mean, he already had the Holy Spirit from the moment of his conception, but something new happened. He was full of the Holy Spirit, and he walked in the power of the Holy Spirit to begin his mission. He is God, yet he chose to live as man, dependent on the Holy Spirit. He chose to live as man, dependent on the Holy Spirit. And from that day, he walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. Very first place the Spirit led him to go was where? The desert. To be tempted by the evil one. Why would the Holy Spirit bring Jesus to a place where there are evil spirits? That doesn't make sense. To show he had power to resist the temptations of the enemy in the power of the Holy Spirit. Did Jesus fight Satan in his divine power? Of course not. He would have annihilated him in a nanosecond. It wouldn't have been a fair fight. He fought the enemy in his weak human nature, in the power of the Holy Spirit. How are we going to fight the temptations of the enemy? In the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, if you aspire to serve the Lord, it says this here, prepare yourself for trials. I mean, the the devil, he doesn't worry so much about, he, he, he doesn't occupy himself so much with people who are not walking with the Lord because they're already in his camp. But if you start walking with the Lord, the devil's going to go after you. Should we be afraid? No. Absolutely not. Because who has the victory? Jesus. Jesus. There, Unfortunately, there are people out there who say, ooh, don't, if you're a lay person, don't get involved in deliverance ministry because there's going to be demonic retaliation. Such a mistaken view. So opposed to the gospel. Yes, there's going to be demonic retaliation, but should we be afraid? No! Are we protected? Yes! Are we guarded by the Lord, by his blood, by his holy angels? Yes! If you go into deliverance ministry, yeah, the devil's going to go after you. If you go into seminary or enter religious life, and the devil's going to go after you. If you aspire to have a holy marriage and raise children in the Lord, the devil's going to go back to you. If you try to live a holy life, evangelize, yeah, the devil's going to go after you. You can't avoid it. What's the answer? You know, get out of the fight? No way. No way. Walk in the victory of the Lord. We will be tempted. The enemy loves to bring down leaders in the church. We've, in the U.S., we've experienced that big time. Some of the most respected, honored leaders, founders of movements, priests even, bishops even, sometimes have been brought down. And the enemy loves to do that because then he can bring down other people by filling them with a shame, disappointment, and disillusionment, anger. We have to not be afraid but walk with the Lord. Jesus is our model. He resisted the enemy in the power of the Holy Spirit, and we too can resist the enemy in the power of the Holy Spirit. There was one other weapon that Jesus used against the devil. What was that? Scripture. The devil tried to quote Scripture to Jesus. That's nervy. <laughs> and Jesus quoted right back to the, the liar who, who twists and distorts misuses the word of God, Jesus came right back at him with the sword of the word of God. So after that, Jesus went into the synagogue at Nazareth and he gave that 
inaugural sermon that I mentioned, his opening homily, which basically sets the program for his whole mission. He took the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he read that passage. It's a passage about the Messiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. It's exactly what had just happened, right? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Do you know what the word anointed is in Hebrew? Anybody? Messiah. Mashiach. Messiah is the anglicized word. He is the Messiah. The very meaning of Messiah is anointed. Anointed one. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has made me the Messiah. The anointed one. He has sent me to proclaim good news to the poor. Liberty to captives, open the eyes of the blind, set the oppressed free. In other words, Jesus is saying, I have been anointed by the Holy Spirit to go right into the mess, the darkness of fallen humanity, to go right into the middle of it. Not only to preach a beautiful message, a consoling message, but to demonstrate it with spirit and power. To actually set people free, actually heal them, to show that the kingdom really is here. As I mentioned this morning, the gospel is not good news without power. Could you say it like you mean it? The gospel is not good news without power. That's what Jesus is saying, and he he read that passage, he sat down, the eyes of all of the synagogue were upon him, and he gave the shortest, most impactful homily ever. Today is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus was saying, this is my mission statement. This, this is the core of what I'm all about. Anointed by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the gospel in power. And remember, he's the model for us. He said that, and then he began to do it. And from that point on, on every page of the gospel, he's healing people. He's casting out demons. He's setting people free. He's opening blind eyes. Are those healings like, uh, you know, a, 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 a sideshow, a peripheral thing that Jesus did occasionally just to make sure everybody knows he's the Son of God? No! They're, they're what he was known for. He is the Lord, our healer, Yahweh Rophetha. When he proclaimed the gospel, he proclaimed it with deeds that demonstrated that the words were true. Now, if that's how Jesus proclaimed the gospel, how did he tell his followers to proclaim the gospel? This is where we, we have to let the gospel really challenge our the, the way we tend to think. Well, it started with the 12 apostles, his chosen leaders, chose the 12, and during his public ministries, they're with him for their three and a half years, he sent them out on their first practical pastoral assignment. Like in seminary, you know, some of the guys, they, they, they have a pastoral year. It's time to put it into practice. Time to activate your training. And he sent them out two by two. And he said, go, proclaim the kingdom is at hand. But that's not all he told them, right? He didn't just say, preach a catechetically well-prepared, pedagogically excellent, rhetorically persuasive, theologically orthodox message. I mean, all of that is good. I mean, he did tell them to do that, but that's not all. Go, proclaim the kingdom as at hand. Heal the sick. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse lepers. Cast out demons. I want you to proclaim the gospel the way I do. Not only in words, but in deeds of power that demonstrate that the words are true. 
That's how the gospel is to be proclaimed. Well, if, if you're like me, or I think met, by far the majority of Catholics, you may have read that passage or you've heard it at Mass and thought, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that cool? Jesus gave his 12 apostles, the, the leaders of the church, a special power as, as they were to go out and, and start the church. But of course, what he says there has nothing to do with me. I used to think that. Until I began to realize, we can't think that way. The gospel doesn't let us think that way. Because you also have to look at another passage. Where Jesus sends out a wider group of 70 or 72 disciples. A disciple is a follower of Jesus, right? So this passage is for you. This is in Luke chapter 10, where Jesus sends out the 70. Lo and behold, he gives them the same instructions. Go, heal the sick, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. I want you to proclaim the gospel the way I do. Not only in words, but in supernatural deeds that confirm that the words are true. Now, I have to share with those in the charismatic renewal. I thank God that he's raised up the charismatic renewal in our time. He, he has brought back to the church something that belongs to us from our beginning. But there is a way that we have tended to live it the power of God. Because we focus so much on charisms. St. Paul has beautiful teaching about charisms, and I give that teaching all the time myself. The Lord, the Holy Spirit does distribute charisms among the faithful, and one of the charisms is healing. One of the charisms is miracles. There's prophecy, tongues, words of knowledge, etc. But we've tended to think well, you only do healings if you have the charism. And not everybody has the charism. In fact, Paul, he implies that. Not everybody has the charism of healing. And that's true. But we've tended to think, well, you know, if you don't have the charism, that, that, that's it. You, you don't, you, you can't expect any healings. But, you know, the basis for our doing healings in Jesus' name is actually not the charism. It's the command of the Lord in the gospel. Go heal the sick. Proclaim the kingdom. That's the foundation of why we expect healings when we evangelize. It's the Lord's command, not the charism. Well, then why did Paul say that not everybody has the charism? Because the charism is like an extra level of anointing that some people are given to see more frequent or more extraordinary healings. It doesn't mean that other people won't see healings. Do what Jesus said, especially in the context of evangelization. Ask for it. The spiritual gifts are analogous to human gifts. So we have to recognize that the foundation was Jesus' command. Okay, so coming back to that passage in Luke 10 where he, he sends out the 70. Again, I used to read the, the passage and think kind of like this. Isn't that wonderful? He gave 70 disciples that supernatural power as the church was being founded. In the first generation, you know, it was a special time as... The, the church was, was just beginning to give them that special power, but of course that has nothing to do with me. And again, as I studied this, I had to realize, I can't say this. It's not faithful to the gospel. Because you also have to read another passage in the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark gives us Mark's version of the, the Great Commission of Jesus. At the end of the Gospel. Jesus is risen from the dead. He's about to ascend into heaven. And he gives his final instructions before leaving earth. So Jesus, at, at the end of Mark, he gives his final instructions, his missionary mandate. And he says, go proclaim the gospel to all creation. 
And these signs will accompany those who believe. This passage is for you. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents. It's, it's not an invitation to pick up serpents. It's saying we will be protected from the enemy. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. The enemy has absolutely no handle on a Christian who is walking with the Lord doing his will. They will lay their hands on the sick and the sick will recover. He said that and then he ascended into heaven. Boom. Do we have any reason to think that since then Jesus has changed his missionary mandate? Do we have any reason to, I mean, just, just the church, the Catholic church teach that, oh, that was only for the first generation, the apostolic era, and, and that time is over. Uh, nobody today should expect healings or miracles. No! There are some Protestant groups that teach that, but the Catholic church does not teach that. Are people today less in need of an encounter with the living Christ than people were in the first century? No, this is Jesus's missionary mandate for all time. Proclaim the gospel. Lay your hands on the sick and they will recover. Thank God that he's raised up the charismatic renewal that reteach us, kind of reactivate what belongs to us. If you want the charisms of the Holy Spirit to wane, if, if you would like that, if you'd like to see faith dwindle, then in your prayer group, pray only over each other for healing. Keep it in your parish. Keep it within your circle. Practice the gifts only on each other. I guarantee it, it, it's a fail-safe way to see the gifts dwindle and to see your faith damp. Jesus said, proclaim the gospel. Heal the sick. No evangelization, no healings, no evangelization, no miracles, no evangelization, no demonstration of spirit and power. If we want to see the power, if we want to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit awakened and come alive, we need to bring them out onto the streets. We need to go into the highways and byways. We need to go to those places where the unevangelized can be found. After Jesus gave this missionary mandate, I, I mentioned um, Matthew's version of the sending of the 12, Luke's version of the sending of the 70, Mark's version of the, the last, by the great commission before Jesus ascended into heaven. And just in case you're not yet convinced, Jesus says in the Gospel of John, Whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. And greater works than I do will he do, because I go to the Father. So by the time Jesus ascended into heaven, they, they may well have been wondering, how are we supposed to do that? Now he's gone, you know, we're here. How are we supposed to do that? And Jesus gave them the answer. And we find it in Luke's version of the Great Commission, end of the Gospel of Luke. Same scene, Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. Go bring my good news to the ends of the earth. But there's one more detail there. It's absolutely essential. He says, don't go yet. Until you are clothed with power from on high. Almost like as if he's saying, green light, red light. <laughs> Go to the ends of the earth. Why don't go yet? <laughs> Hold on. There's one more thing you need. Consider who he is speaking to. He's speaking to his apostles and other disciples. These are guys who have been with Jesus for three and a half years. They have had the best seminary formation in history. They've had the most amazing Bible study ever from the Word of God itself. They have had the world's wisest 
spiritual director. They have orthodoxy. They are completely orthodox. In fact, they define orthodox because to be orthodox is to be in keeping with the teaching of the apostles. They even have the Eucharist. They have it all, right? And Jesus says, don't go yet. There's one more thing you need. Wait until you're clothed with power from on high. And then at the beginning of Acts, he says the same thing over again. We get the same scene repeated because we so need to get it. The same scene repeated, but using different words, Jesus says, don't go yet. Stay in the city before many days. You will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's the one thing you need. That's what will clothe you with power from on high. You will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And when he said that, baptism was not yet a sacrament. It was not yet even a theological word. It was an ordinary word. You're going to be saturated with the power of God that will change you radically. That's what, what you need. That's the one thing necessary. Don't try to carry out your mission without that. So do we see the churches burgeoning with new members? Do we see Catholics all over the place, on the streets, in coffee houses, proclaiming Jesus? I mean, what's going on? We've been hearing this message for 60 years now. What's missing? You'll be clothed with power from on high. You will be baptized in the Holy Spirit, plunged into the Spirit of God. If we don't open ourselves to the Holy Spirit, we cannot and must not expect we're going to see the world come to Jesus. We've got to be willing to let go of our own control of our, as a church, our own pride as a church. Like we know what we're doing. We've got this. We have you know, structures, institutions, everyone, you know, we just keep going. We have got to open the door to the Holy Spirit. <laughs>